of different questions about spine surgery, spine conditions. The things I like to highlight are different myths or misconceptions about the spine. That could be the best treatment and fixes for scoliosis, the best treatment and fixes for disc herniations. I'll go over different conditions. I'll answer some questions. I try to avoid being too specific on certain medical conditions, um, but we'll just go ahead, go on there and answer some questions as they kind of come up. So the first thing I get asked is what's my background? Uh, again, I'm a spine surgeon here in Dallas, Texas. This is the same area I grew up in, born and raised in. In terms of the conditions I treat, so I treat everything from the cervical spine, thoracic spine, and lumbar spine. So anything from the neck, mid back to lower back. Happy to um, discuss any of those or all of those. Appreciate all the likes coming through. That kind of helps promote this to other people. So the main question I get asked is, what's the best way to get a disc herniation better? Well, the quick and the easy way to answer that question is time. Time is the best way to get a disc herniation better. If someone's at home, obviously thinking, if everyone at home is obviously thinking, what's the best? but it's not. Here's how you buy time. It goes bone, disc, bone, disc. The best way to get that time is to take care of these symptoms, and that's anti-inflammatories, that's sometimes steroids, that's sometimes muscle relaxers, physical therapy, epidural steroid injections, bracing. Those are all things that kind of help cancel out the irritation from the pinched nerve, and that's one of the best ways to um, address the disc herniation is buying that time. So when time doesn't work, so say you've had this for several weeks or several months and you can't enjoy the things you want to do in life, then that's when either additional injections or surgery might be the best thing to help you. So bone, disc, bone, disc, bone, and the best way to address the issue is one to diagnose the issue. So that's with an x-ray, an exam, also an MRI. The MRI will show me, is it a disc herniation that's pinching the nerve? Is it something called facet arthritis, like a joint arthritis that's pinching the nerve? Those are the kind of key things to identify what's causing the issue. And that helps the surgeon figure out if there needs to be an open surgical treatment, a minimally invasive surgical treatment, a disc replacement, a fusion, kind of all those things. So good question from um, L. Lock, J. Lock. What are you showing in SI fusion? I'm not showing that yet, but here's how SI fusions work. So it goes neck, cervical spine, thoracic spine, lumbar spine. And SI fusion is if this is the thoracic spine, so here's the lumbar part, sorry, thoracic part, lumbar part. This is the sacroiliac joint. This is the pelvis, this is the sacrum. So the sacroiliac joint is kind of this part right back in here. If you're looking at the front, it's another way to look at it, it's kind of this joint right in here. Well, there's a couple ways to do an SI joint fusion. One of the historical ways that we spine doctors don't do as much anymore it's called the posterior approach. And this is really important because this is the only way that um, pain management doctors are able to do this. So if you're looking from the front, they lay down and they just wedge a piece of metal through the back through here. That's how pain management doctors do it. And that's pretty, um, it's not the best way to do it like that. That's the most politically correct way. I think I can say that. The way that spine surgeons who are trained who do a surgical fellowship surgical residency to do surgery, to do those surgeries, are the following. They do it from a lateral approach. That's where you make an incision on the side, kind of on the butt muscle, and through the side is where you place one, two, or three pins that go through and create the SI joint fusion. So those are what my spine colleagues do, is the lateral approach. Um, in fact, when I book those cases, I have to have a peer-to-peer -peer with the insurance company and they won't approve the posterior approach. And that's something that pain management doctors do. They do the posterior approach. Spine surgeons typically do the lateral approach. And I'll kind of just leave it at that. My bias is obviously I support pain management doctors. I have them in my group and I think they're great. But I think that surgeons should be doing spine surgery and pain management doctors should not be doing surgery. And it's that simple and it's that blunt. So let me ask some other questions now. Um, from Scotty, take me to your leader. Another patient is asking, Amanda, arachnoiditis, what do you do? I don't treat arachnoiditis. In short, it's a inflammation of the nerves kind of all running down the tunnel. So I apologize, I really don't have too much uh, treatment for arachnoiditis. It's kind of a 
Pandora's box, or uh, that's probably not a good way, black box. We don't really have a lot of definition of what causes it. We don't have a lot of definition of how to treat it. Spinal stenosis, that's a great question from Nikki, from Nikki Mary by the Sea. So spinal stenosis is the following. It goes bone, disc bone. If you are walking, or if this is your neck or lumbar spine, if you look down the tunnel of the spine, this is where the whole thing is. So this is the sac. It's like a balloon that all the nerves are running down, is this area right here. When it gets squeezed for whatever reason, that's spinal stenosis. No matter what's causing the squeezing, it's spinal, and then stenosis is just a medical word for squeezing. Now, to pay, based on what's causing the squeezing, that's why that's how you get it fixed or how serious it is. If it's a tumor, that's obviously a big deal. That's the bones growing here, it could be squeezing in. If it's arthritis, so bone thickening, tissue thickening from the bone just kind of wearing out, that's another reason that squeezes it here. If it's from a disc herniation, so again, here's the model, if you have a disc that pops out and it squeezes it, that would be squeezing the nerves. That's a whole nother way you get spinal stenosis. So spinal stenosis in itself isn't the problem, it's really the underlying issue of what's causing the spinal stenosis. So I'll just say it one more time. So spinal stenosis is just any type of squeezing of all these nerves here. The issue of what causes the spinal stenosis is what guides the treatment, is what guides whether it's surgery, non-surgery, uh, minimally invasive surgery, fusion, disc replacements, all that stuff. Nikki, I appreciate the gifts coming through and everyone that send gifts. I kind of jokingly say, don't send me any gifts. Save your money for other organizations. I'm a, you know, I'm a spine surgeon. I don't need TikTok money, so I kind of do this just to educate people. So save it for you know, the people in third world countries doing TikTok for a living. I think they're the ones who are more deserving. All right, what about an ulnar tear and degenerative disc disease? Ulnar tear. I don't know if I know what an ulnar tear is. You have your ulna, which is their bone here. A tear of that. I'm not really sure what that is. Uh, degenerative disc disease. DDD is just a fancy medical word for your disc is wearing out. Some of it's genetics, some of it's wear and tear, some of it's lifestyle, some of it's if you're diabetic, so you have a higher rate, if you're obese, you have a higher rate, if you're a smoker, cigarettes, uh, maybe even um, marijuana, just different smoking factors to give toxins to these disc spaces. So that's essentially what degenerative disc disease is. The question I get asked all the time is where am I located? I'm in Dallas, Texas. This is the area I went to elementary school, born and raised, went to college here. So it's my home area. These are my home community. So my reputation is on the line with every patient I treat. So I take it very seriously. Uh, do I do telemedicines if you're not from Dallas? Obviously, for sure. You know, I do probably 15 new patient telemedicines a week. That's from all over the country. Uh, you can just send me a uh, direct message. I can't give any medical advice, but if you send me a direct message, I can go ahead and connect you with my scheduling team and then kind of set you up. You need an x-ray and an MRI to make it worth your time and money. But I don't want this to be an ad. I kind of just want to answer some questions. So the thing I really want to focus on today is uh, to kind of go over different questions you have about the spine. I kind of just want to answer and I think that's kind of the best way to go over different issues. If you've heard something, let's kind of talk about some open forum and I probably jump on here for another five to 10 minutes. Appreciate all of the likes and shares coming through. So what can be done about degenerative disc disease? Really it's treating the symptoms. Once the disc starts wearing out, there's no way to necessarily reverse it. You can just slow the progress. And some of that is lifestyle modifications, controlling your modifiable risk factor, is weight, um, certain laboring jobs, that causes more of it. What do you do with wedge disc? I'm not exactly sure what a wedge disc is. Um, if you say that Differently, maybe I can answer it. Um, Dr. Donnelly treated me with surgery. I did fantastic. Thank you, heart, heart. I appreciate that so much. SI joint issues common with hip replacements. Not common with hip replacements, but they are common with fusions. Long fusions in the spine. So long fusions in the spine could cause SI joint issues. Uh, ligaments and flavum hypertrophy. How serious is it? Not, it's, that's kind of, it's kind of a long answer. So having thickened the ligaments and flavum, that's if you look down the tunnel, I don't have it on the spine model. There's tissue all around here. If it gets very thick, it can start squeezing. That in itself is not the end of the world. You can have severe spinal stenosis your whole life and be asymptomatic, honestly, but it's the symptoms that are causing it. So if that's the reason you're having the shooting down leg pain and sometimes the back pain, well, that's an easy fix if it's just that, because that could be something, again, not medical advice. I don't know your situation at all, but it could be treated with just a laminectomy uh, outpatient. Again, that's a very broad generalization without knowing any of the other issues. 
Pressure on the thoracic nerves, it could be a disc herniation of the thoracic spine, it wraps around. Are fusions bad in the long term? No, you know, they're, it kind of is like a long answer, right? So if you need a fusion, then you're gonna do great. And I know that's an oversimplification, but like if you need to have spine surgery because you fail non-operative things and your life's awful, then you gotta do it. I'm not saying like it's the only option, but once you kind of reach that point of no return, it's not like you're afraid of what your future is gonna be without it. Your future with it is gonna be a lot better. So that being said, does it put more pressure on the other levels? It does, but it's kind of something where, you know, the die has been cast. If you need a fusion at that level, because you have severe instability, you have a fracture of the bone, if you have a disc herniation of a spot that you can't get unless you have to do a fusion, then your choices are either live with the pain, try non-operative stuff for however long you want to try it, or get surgery. If you have foot drop or muscle weakness and you have to get a fusion to fix it, well, if you're scared of fusions, I understand that, but you know, it's kind of, this is what kind of God has given. This is kind of what your genetics have given. If you need a certain surgery, then you kind of need a certain surgery. So are fusions bad? Going back to that question, not really. You know, it'd be better not to have a fusion, obviously. It'd be better not to have surgery. It's kind of like if your shoulder wears out and you have to get a rotator cuff repair, or if your hip or knee wears out and you have to get a hip or knee replaced. Are those bad? Well, no, but like, I hope I never have to get a hip replacement, even though those are some of the best surgeries we do. Man, I don't want a hip replacement, I, and I know how good they are, but I really don't want one. So I think that's kind of a way to look at it. Fusions are the gold standard for multiple conditions in the spine. I'm not trying to up here um, preaching it, but that's kind of an issue. Okay, so there is a mosquito flying around. So if you see me clap in a second, I have to get it. It's gonna bother me all live stream. So I'm here in Dallas, we have a lot of mosquitoes. Um, and it's super hot, just like it is everywhere else in America. All right, I'll get to a couple other questions. And again, you can always direct message me. I see there's, you know, there's about a thousand people in the chat right now. So if I miss your question, I do definitely apologize. And they kind of come in pretty fast. Which implant companies do you prefer? I use probably six or seven implant companies. So I'm kind of all over the map. Different companies have uh, different things for different spinal fusions. I think they're great. I use different disc replacements based on patient's anatomy. I use different uh, fusion cages based on um, curvature of the spine and kind of what I need to get done. Thoughts on PRP or stem cells for ligament whiplash? Um, oh man, I don't think you should do that. If you got like whiplash and you're actually going through like a lawyer, because that's sometimes where you hear this terminology and that group is doing stem cells, they're just trying to run up your bill for the better settlement. So I would just kind of avoid any of that if that's where you're going there. My thoughts on stem cells and PRP is the following. But just to be very clear, I'm only talking about spine surgery. I don't have any comment about PRP and stem cells and sports and elbows and professional pitchers, any of that stuff. I'm just purely talking about in the disc space to regenerate the disc. There's no science that show that it regenerates the disc space or that it regenerates the disc to a clinically significant level. There's multiple studies that show it's just as good as placebos in the um, spine, in the lumbar spine. And one of the other things that I think just point out is anytime you're getting those stem cells or PRP, it's a cash only business. Yeah, there's spine surgeons out there that are doing it. I'm definitely not hating on them. I'm definitely not against them. But I just kind of want to point out that um, if you have a spine surgeon on social media saying he doesn't do it because there's no FDA science behind it and he's taking the cash that he shouldn't be the bad guy for telling patients just to, you know, I know patients are looking for the holy grail. No one wants surgery. People want to get better and you're willing to spend money on it. I just kind of caution you for maybe spending too much money on it and I'll just kind of leave it at that. Okay, a couple other questions and I have to go in just a little bit. How bad is spondylosis? So spondylosis could be when the bone slips forward on the other. It could be as bad as a grade one, two, three, or four. Question from Teresa. Is there a corrective surgery for arachnoiditis? Um, arachnoiditis is something I'm not extremely um, versed in. I haven't done too many of my own research studies in arachnoiditis, but essentially it's, it's inflammation of the nerves and it's usually a post-operative issue. Uh, so there are some surgeons out there that have treatment algorithms for it. If I have a patient with suspected arachnoiditis, I refer them out to those that kind of treat it exclusively. From Diane Ramis, I'm fused from T9 pelvis and I'm still in pain. Probably so, that's a huge surgery. So T9, I'm not gonna count the whole spine, but it's probably right, one of these several bones right here. So fusing from here all the way down to pelvis is one of the biggest elective spine surgeries we do. The reason someone would need such a big surgery is usually you're in your 50s, 60s, maybe 70s, and you have adult degenerative disease. 
with scoliosis. There's multiple, multiple, multiple studies showing that if you have, if you're in your 60s, 70s, and you have significant kyphosis, so if you're walking, but you're clout, collapsed over like that, so now you have to bend your hips and knees to kind of get you back like this. You have to fire your back muscles all day. You have something called neurogenic claudication. Your quality of life is consistent with those with untreated HIV and tumors. You have such a poor quality of life. So people that get massive spine fusions, you know, it's a big surgery with major complication risk, but if your quality of life is on par with those who have certain cancers, who have certain um, hard to treat systemic conditions, that's what the, um, they're called outcome index studies, such as ODI or PROMs, or patient reported outcome measures. If your quality of life has shown to be equivalent with those with significant long-term disease, then yeah, a spine fusion might be right for you because it's got to reverse that issue, especially if you have another 10, 15, 20, 30 years ahead of you, that's definitely worth having a big fusion surgery for. Now we do that a lot now in 2023 than even we did six years ago. The spine surgeons of today, those that know what they're talking about, are much more focused on things called pelvic parameters. And I'm gonna bore everyone here, because even if you're a fourth year orthopedic resident, you're gonna be bored about this. But very, very, very long story short, pelvic parameters are what we do these days. We look at the hips on an X-ray, Ray, like where the hips are in relationship to the L5S1. And we see if you're kind of curved back, hunched forward, if you have a big slope in the spine. And when we do spine surgery, our goal is to get your alignment good, whether it's a one level surgery or a 10 level surgery. Your alignment matters because that decreases your need for a second and third surgery later in life. 